Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. The Chandrayaan mission and the Vikram lander have made an astonishing discovery on the surface of the moon, something that will have tremendous implications for the future of human colonization. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon, and once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. Been enjoying my trip across North America thus far. Things have been going extremely well, both in Florida and in Pittsburgh. And now I am still here in Toronto. Uh, tomorrow on Thursday is when we're going to be having our next event from 6.30 to 8.30. The details are in the description. And from there, we're going to be heading westward. Not too certain about my Cincinnati facilities um, kind of lost contact with the individual that I was trying to work that with and if you happen to live in that area and have any leads on a uh, on a small meeting space for about $300 or less, I would be deeply appreciative. My email is in the description. Otherwise, I'm going to have to move on straight to Denver, which is something I really don't want to do. And of course, if you want to support this event and also get yourself a digital copy of my book reserved, and by the way, that book should be complete by the end of this month, taking a little bit longer to work through everything, given the complications of leaving my home of 25 years and traveling across the country, but nevertheless, uh, making good progress should definitely have it done by the end of September. But in the meantime, if you'd like to support this tour, well, all the details are in the description. Enough about that. Let's move on to what's going on on the moon. So the Vikram lander and its rover were only on the moon, or at least active on the moon, for a small grouping of days, and yet during that time made some incredible discoveries. But the most significant of these discoveries is the fact that the temperature on the south pole of the moon was not what we thought it was going to be. Obviously, without an atmosphere and with no protection whatsoever to direct sunlight, we expected some very high temperatures at the surface of the moon, which, of course, is what we got. But that changes once you just go a few centimeters beneath the surface. The lunar regolith has proven to be an incredibly useful thing to future colonization because it was the temperature that we thought was going to be our biggest barrier to colonization and was going to require the most energy in order to simply heat or cool a facility depending on the time of day it was, the lunar day of course lasting 28 days total. We thought that that was going to be one of our biggest barriers and something that would consume the most energy. However, it turns out that just a little bit of lunar regolith changes everything. When I first started reporting on this particular mission, some people thought that this was just some sort of national statement on the part of India. They wanted to demonstrate that they could get to the South Pole of the Moon before anybody else could, and nothing else was really going to be accomplished, and that is utterly untrue. Instead, the Vikram lander, part of the Chandrayaan-3 mission, probably the most important part obviously, has carried out some amazing measurements on the moon that really change everything about our plans to colonize our natural satellite. That may sound like an exaggeration, but it just isn't. The instrument that carried out these measurements was called the Chandra's Surface Thermophysical Experiment, or the CHA a simple temperature measuring device that was designed to measure the thermal conductivity and temperature of the lunar surface. That is to say, what is the temperature on the surface and what is the temperature just beneath the surface? Because some scientists were starting to think that the lunar regolith might provide some sort of insulating effects on the temperature and that things might normalize just a little bit beneath the surface. What we didn't know is just how shallow the temperatures change and how radical that change is. 
At the surface, while exposed to all of the heat that the sun could throw at it, the temperatures were, as pretty much expected, 55 degrees Celsius or approximately 133 degrees Fahrenheit. However, less than 30 millimeters beneath the surface, that temperature dropped to just over 30 degrees Celsius, and the freezing point of water was achieved at only 70 millimeters beneath the surface. 70 millimeters of lunar regolith was producing 55 degrees worth of change, 55 degrees Celsius, that is, on the moon absolutely astonishing. And by the time you get down to 80 millimeters, the temperature has dropped even further to negative 10 degrees Celsius. And it is suspected that the temperature will drop even further the deeper you go until things more or less equalize. Because the moon is a very inactive body, at least we think it is, although there is certainly some seismic activity on the moon, but again, not a great deal. So we suspect that the moon core and the temperatures beneath the surface of the moon are pretty damn low. But that's not the point. The point is there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of thermal conductivity with the regolith on the moon. As a matter of fact, very little. That being the case then, it has unbelievably efficient thermal insulating qualities. You just put a little of this stuff over the top of your habitat and the temperature inside is going to remain more or less constant without expensive and energy intensive heating. And why is this so significant? Well, I'm going to be quoting extensively from an article entitled Determination of Temperature Variation on Lunar Surface and Subsurface for Habitat Analysis and Design <sighs> by Ramesh Mala and Kevin M. Brown of the University of Connecticut. They have this to say about future moon habitats. Quote, aside from the dangerous radiation levels and hypervelocity micrometeoroid impacts, the Equatorial temperature on the surface of the moon can range from 102.4 degrees Kelvin to 387.1 degrees Kelvin. These extremes pose a variety of complications like thermal expansion and contraction, which can in turn alter the static, dynamic, and frequency response of a structure. And by the way, in this ESA video about lunar habitats, you're seeing just how many difficulties we're going to be working against in order to build any sort of habitable structures on the moon. The Earth provides so much protection, an insulating atmosphere that keeps things warm, that protects us from radiation, and also protects us from micrometeoroids. How do we get around that? By building a structure that takes advantage of the insulating qualities of the lunar regolith. This particular design, by the way, is designed to be carried inside the fairing of an Ariane 6 rocket, so well within our capabilities in the near future. It includes a cylinder, an inflatable dome, and also two 3D printing robots. Now, a lot of you have probably seen this video before, but it's pretty interesting all of the thought that went into this design. This base was designed by Foster and Partners, who are renowned architects who joined with ESA to test the feasibility of 3D printing using lunar regolith. Laurent Pamguin, I'm not sure if I've got that name right or not, but he said, quote, terrestrial 3D printing technology has produced entire structures. Our industrial team investigated if it could be similarly employed to build a lunar habitat. As you can see, an inflatable dome provides part of the structure, but really, most of the strength is being provided by 3D printed regolith. The robots have scoops designed to pick up the regolith and then 3D printing heads in order to apply it to the dome. The dome, by the way, is a catenary structure, which is extremely efficient for holding up lots of weight because it was previously thought that they were going to need a meter or so of regolith in order to provide the necessary insulation. This may not be the case anymore. A mere 15 centimeters of regolith is all you need in order to provide adequate radiation protection. And as we have now seen, thanks to the Vikram lander, you don't need a meter of regolith in order to regulate the temperature either. 
150 millimeters will be more than enough, which is gonna make the process of building something like this a whole lot easier. It will require a lot less construction, a lot less energy to power the robots because they're putting on perhaps 15% as much regolith as was originally thought. And in addition to that, you're going to have temperatures that are going to be self-regulated inside the dome without a lot of exterior power being required, which means your nuclear reactor can be committed to other applications besides just heating the dome and providing basic life support. This base, by the way, is large enough to accommodate four astronauts, although you could probably build something a hell of a lot larger if you use the fairing of Starship to include the same kind of model, except a much bigger cylinder and perhaps a lot more robots as well. And so the Vikram is taking care of a big missing piece in our overall design for lunar bases. Again, according to this paper, quote, a key component of these habitat systems is the use of in situ resource utilization through the use of lunar regolith as an environmental shield. It is essential for the design of these structures to know how the temperature will vary through the depth of this regolith cover in order to accurately study the thermal stresses and deflections that can be expected within the frame. Well, thanks to Vikram, we now know just how radically these temperatures vary through the regolith and how insulating the regolith actually it is. Much better than we ever dreamed. But there's a lot more that the Vikram has found on top of that. Utilizing an experiment called Laser-Induced Breakdown Spectroscopy, or LIBS, the Vikram has determined that there is not only a substantial amount of oxygen bound into the lunar regolith, which of course has obvious applications, but in addition to that, substantial percentages of manganese, titanium, aluminum, and other useful substances. Now, manganese is especially interesting to me because it's involved in the construction of of batteries. Batteries, of course, being very important to solar panels here on Earth. Instead of mining manganese and especially cobalt on Earth, and if you've seen previous videos that I've done on this topic, you will know that in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, thousands of children are engaged in what amounts to slave labor cobalt mining gathering up this material oftentimes with simple implements or even more often their hands. Instead of supporting slave labor, we can instead extract these valuable resources from the moon and transport them to Earth via what's called a lunar cycler. If you're interested in how that works, well, I have a video on the topic linked at the end of this video. But the long and the short of it is, we have found that the moon is now far more habitable than we ever thought, and it also is rich in resources which can feed our power-hungry and resource-hungry civilization far into the future, and we can do it without damaging our precious environment here on this planet. This is an amazing series of discoveries made by the Vikram Lander and by the Indian Space Agency. Discoveries that will help us colonize our natural satellite, exploit its resources, and support our civilization far into the future. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe, and also please consider supporting my ongoing tour. All of the information on how to do that is in the description. And until everything that you've been seeing on this video becomes a reality, I urge all of you to stay angry about space.